class of SBDC. So a couple things, we have our uh, job and career fair coming up on May the 11th at the class of county fairgrounds. We have a meeting on Thursday this week, the planning committee, we need a lot of volunteers for that. It's free for employers. Debbie Newton is the co-chair, what's that? I put flyers on the table. Debbie has flyers on the table. Thank you, Debbie. How many uh, employers right now? We have over 40 employers as of now. Uh, our Cedar Awards event is coming up on May 26th, our annual event at the Patriot Hall here at Astoria. We'll begin the applications and nomination form site here very shortly. Where's Misty Bateman at? Oh, there. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Misty Bateman, who is our new class of sports internship coordinator. <laughs> I'll hand the mic over here just quickly as we hand it back to you, Scott. That's okay to say a few words. And on the SBDC front, we have a great um, kickoff today of a business boot camp. Sorry, your business were, were full. We had to close down um, registrations. But we do have on April 21st exit funding for small businesses. Uh, on Arnie Hendricks connected at April 21st, and that's the update. So I'll pass it over to Ms. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Everybody, 
Parity Square has been in the paper quite a bit, and so I thought I'd just give you a quick update on that. We had a our second open house uh, last Thursday, and we showed option D, uh, which was a scheme where um, we have reduced the CDH footprint. Uh, we took open house out of the project, so we're just doing 33 units of zero to 30 percent AMI area median income. We have 64 units of affordable housing between 60 percent and 80 percent AMI, um, which gets us up to about 1975 an hour. Um, we are. Uh, I added a public plaza. Oh, and by the way, on the project architect, and I, my office is right over there. <laughs> Um, we are putting in about a 8,500 square foot public plaza that could be parking or event for events or whatever. We, we heard from the, a lot of uh, feedback from the community. And um, we are at about four stories, which is allowable by code. Um, we're going to, it's kind of an L-shaped building, so mostly on 12th Street and Exchange Street. Um, we're going to, I'm designing it, so look, I'm looking at a lot of the historic buildings uh, around, around the project. Uh, we're in a historic district. And um, we, have, we have been looking at this pit for about 12 years. And um, with no end in sight, uh, the city has uh, uh, been uh, very interested in doing affordable housing. Uh, we all know about our housing um, well, we call it a crisis in some areas uh, throughout the county, and we want to do something about it. Um, I personally think this is a good location. I think it's going to help activate downtown. I know there are issues about parking that we're talking to a lot of people about, um, and uh, we've been an open book, so please, if you have any, any issues, uh, feel free to contact me or one of our team members. Um, I'm part of the Eadland team. Uh, Eadland Development is a development company that I've known for 20 years out of Portland. They're really good community-based uh, uh, developers. Uh, we have two other members, um, local members on our team. We're, we also are bringing in Walsh Construction. Uh, Walsh and I are working on the Trillium House. It's going to break ground over by Home Depot next month. So you'll see a lot of activity over there. We're going to have 42 units of affordable housing uh, in that location. Um, so I've been talking to, uh, like I go to the co-op and I talk to a checker at the co-op and I tell them what we're doing and they just thank me. Uh, we have so many 20, 30, 40 somethings in this town who can't find housing. And I've looked at Zillow frequently and maybe there's one, maybe there's a, two apartments available, but it's really hard to find housing for our work. Uh, our workforce. So that's that's our goal for the project. Thank you. Thank you. Who wasn't here this morning? Oh, I just uh, yep. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I forgot one thing. So over on the barrel, I have uh, handouts. Uh, so please, when you go out, uh, there's there's the, some data and whatever, some information on the project. Thanks, sir. Taking Will's not here this morning, so I'm going to pass this off to Heather. From Camp One along. Uh, good morning. My name is Heather Douglas. I work at the Classic Community College through the Meyer Memorial Trust Grant. Um, the organization is called the Alliance for Equity and Education. And we are hosting in collaboration with three different organizations in the area an inclusion and equity conference. So if your business is interested in learning and training your workers around equity issues, it's free and open to the public. It'll be at Camp Kuanalong, and it's going to be April 23rd. Our keynote speaker is Donovan Scribes, and uh, it went out in your all's newsletter um, recently, so you might have seen it. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, thank you. And I'm Jenny Newton, I'm working with Nestoray School District, I'm the Social Emotional Learning Coordinator, and so I'm, we're, we're working together on this project for the North Coast Inclusion Seminar. And we want to offer to any of the businesses in the community an opportunity to give us brochures or um, uh, coupons or advertising that we can include in our welcome packets for all the members. The weekend is the Craft Festival weekend, but it's in the morning, on that Saturday morning, so it feels like it could be shared well with, with visitors. 
Um, but, and, but it is important that the businesses in this are showing that there's support for equity and inclusion in our community. So anything you want like that, that we could provide for all of the attendees, and we're, we're up to, to about 40 attendees so far, but we're, it's open, it, we just opened the registration process and that the poster you received in your newsletter has a, a QR code to register. Um, but they would receive whatever, whatever Astoria uh, businesses might want to provide um, information about, about support of businesses and equity. So if you have those things, you can either email us or just drop them off at the Astoria School District office. And we decided that was our most central location point, easiest to find. So if you don't drop them off there, I have an office in the building, they'll just bring them to me or they'll tell me that they're there. And if anybody wants anything in there, if we can get it by April 19th, that would be the best uh, because then we can fit them into, into their folders. So thank you very much for having us. We both have to go back to school, so yeah. <laughs> sorry. We're going to jet that way. <laughs> We have a lot of information in there. Um, I do want to just make one, two quick comments. One, May 11th is both the Class of uh, Career and Job Fair and the Workforce Council at um, at, at some point. So I'm declaring. Is that right? We changed the date to the 18th. So we May did, we Perfect. Did. Okay. So that's a week of investment in, in generational um, talent there because both of those are really important. So no vacations during that time. Same for people. <laughs> And the other is, I just want to thank Stuart. Um, there's lots of room for conversation about what project should be at Heritage Square, what Heritage Square should be, but Stuart and his team have been very responsive to feedback on that. They've evolved that project. And so um, just do take a look at the latest iteration um, while, while you're making your decision on, on Heritage Square. So. All right, as we get our presentation set up for our guest speaker today, I'm going to pass the mic around and have everybody take 30 seconds to introduce is a, um, a major investor in our community, investor in, in infrastructure, investor in uh, workforce, investor in just about everything that's good about this place. And we are really, really very happy to have them in our community. And I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Happy to be here today. It's really uh, the last couple of years, I think, my first kind of face to face meeting in the same room. I live in Portland, people are more squeamish up there about uh, COVID for, for good reason. It's been a really tough period. So um, Lindsay's going to help me with the slides today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hampton, but also really more what's going on in the forest products industry. Uh, people in Oregon have a lot of opinions about trees and forestry. It definitely affects our business. So there's a lot going on and has been going on for quite a while. So I'll talk a little bit about what's new and, and what we're seeing now. So a bit of an info uh, commercial, uh, commercial about Hampton. We are going to celebrate our 80th anniversary this year. For those of you involved in family businesses, that's quite an achievement. You not only have to run a successful business, but the family has to get along. And in our business where trees, when you plant trees, it usually takes 40 to 50. Some people grow trees that are 80 years old. You better have a long-term commitment from the family and the owner to stay in that business. So we're really proud. We're working on some events and things like that uh, for the communities and employees and things like that every year. In terms of what we do, um, we're a bit unique in the industry in that we're vertically integrated. So we have 10 sawmills, four in Oregon, three in Washington, two in British Columbia, and then we have a brand new sawmill that's supposed to come online Cross my fingers in August up in British Columbia. As you can imagine with the COVID and everything else that's been going on, supply chain stuff, we were supposed to open up in February. Now we're hoping to open it up in, uh, in August. We're probably the, in the top 10 in the United States in terms of sawmill lumber production. We're the largest lumber producer in the Pacific Northwest. So not everybody knows that. People know warehouse or people like that. But been at it a long time and spent a lot of our energy trying to make our sawmills really good and so we've been able to survive by some mills having to be. We also own some timber land. Uh, you met a couple gentlemen who work on our Big Creek tree farm here nearby. We have about 90,000 acres in Oregon and 155,000 acres in Washington. We also own some timber licenses up in British Columbia. So a 
as I'll talk a little later, it's been a really good period, believe it or not, for the last few years in the lumber business. So we've taken those profits and invested in more timber, which is a great long-term asset for the company. We're also somewhat unique in that we have a wholesale business. So most people that have sawmills, they sell their lumber production. We sell our lumber production, but we also sell other people's production. So we may buy lumber from Interpol or Weyerhaeuser and resell it. We have a very big panel sales division, even though we don't make any flight. Uh, we have a Chinese, I mean a, uh, a cedar division that in uh, Canada and down here in, in Oregon sell cedar products. We also uh, export lumber uh, to Japan. We don't export logs, we export lumber to Japan, other countries in Asia. We import fencing products from around the world. Uh, there's a big shortage of fencing, especially during the, the COVID period. And so uh, we bring in a lot of containers from overseas and sell that as well. So it makes it pretty unique from a marketing standpoint. Home Depot and Lowe's are our two biggest customers. So as you go around the country, uh, you'll see our products. Typically, we're selling in Home Depot in one region. We're not allowed to sell those. Great customer in the forest. In terms of our sawmill business here locally, the Warrington Sawmill, we bought during the Great Recession from Weyerhaeuser, and we've been fixing it up with capital investments over the last uh, seven or eight years. We have about 150 employees there. Uh, as I heard a lot of talk, and we talk a lot in our company about affordable housing, uh, it's been a little bit challenging to keep uh, all the positions filled in our Warrington Sawmill. Great place to work. We have minimum uh, wages that start in the early uh, low 40,000 a year. Great health care, great retirement plan. Yet uh, we bring people here and they go, well, Where are we going to live? That's affordable. Or they go, We can go across the river and not pay any taxes. So uh, it's a challenge uh, for sure, but we're doing pretty well there. We run two shifts, we run about 80% of capacity. We make a little over 200 million board feet a year, which is a pretty good sized sawmill. There are sawmills out there that will run 350, 400 million feet at the very top end. Uh, so this would be between medium and large size uh, sawmill here. We also, as I mentioned, have timberland in the area, Big Creek Tree Farm, is about 34,000 acres. Beautiful, iconic timberland, grows trees really well. We also own some timberland across the river call our napkin and they sell. So it's been a, we're heavily involved, as you mentioned, in Boston County, get involved from a, from a family perspective. Hampton, there's three Hamptons that own the company. They're on the board of directors, but they're not in the day-to-day -day op operations, which is somewhat unusual. Uh, but they're very active, not only in the business side, but the arts side. So maybe you've seen uh, Jamie and Ashley's Body Box Company, the Liberty Theater. Or David and Jamie have a band, Brothers Jam, that plays like Grateful Dead and Tom Petty. So they'll go around Oregon and play at various events and things like that. So it's a great family, as I mentioned before. They're very long-term thinkers. And you have to be in this business to go through a lot of uh, difficult cycles. So the pandemic, we've all hopefully been through it for the last time. You never really know. One of the things that benefited our company and our business was we were deemed essential workers versus a lot of places had to shut down. I know if you're in the retail business or the restaurant business, it's been a really tough period. It's actually been a pretty good period for us from a profitability standpoint. It's been challenging. Um, you may have met Lois Perdue, who's our manager here in, in Warrington, does a great job. All our folks have done a great job during the pandemic keeping our operations running. So we've had to do all the protocols, all the cleaning, all the social distancing. We can't really do a lot of remote working in the sawmill business. Um, some of our programmers, computer people, can work at home a little bit, but you know, if, if the edger needs to be operated, somebody has to be there. So um, we really appreciate what people have done in our company. We've paid out a number of special bonuses and recognition for the work that people have done, being out there on the front lines, uh, keeping our product moving. We've also done a lot of things in terms of uh, stepping up our community donations, working, getting gift certificates from restaurants for our employees, bringing in lunches, things like that to support some of the community 
uh, businesses that have struggled a lot during, during this period. But amazingly, during the pandemic first hit in late February, and it's like, oh no, here comes another great recession. And having run the company for a number of years, I've lived through some of these cycles, and I thought, oh no, not another period when nobody wants to buy a house. And within a week or two, our orders just started jumping from Home Depot and Lowe's because they were left open. And people said, well, we can't go out and do vacation, the kids can't go to school, we're gonna work on home projects. So everybody went to the local lumber yard and, and bought products. So if you look at the next slide, probably a lot of you don't have uh, revenue pictures that look like this with your product prices. Um, if I took you all the way back to the Great Recession, you could really see the, the downturns. But 2019 was a pretty good year for us. We had a lot of momentum going. And then you can see in uh, about March 2020, we had a little bit of dip. These are product prices for a composite group of lumber products. When we were thinking, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to uh, temporarily close down some mills. Uh, but all of a sudden the orders started coming in. You can see what happened to the, the lumber price besides the demand being there. Supply was hard because people were being affected by COVID as well, whether that's trucks or sawmill workers. We've had a lot of our sawmills operating with 10 or 20 people out so, uh, but the lumber price went soaring up. Uh, log prices went up some, but not as much because there were a lot of logs available to salvage logging from the fires a couple of years ago. And then you can see we kind of had a scary drop there in um, last summer. As you may recall, things started to open up. They thought COVID was behind us. Everybody wanted to go on vacation. They were tired of staying around home. Nobody went to Home Depot because the prices were too high and they had other things to do. Nobody wanted to pay $85 for a sheet of plywood. And so all of a sudden, supply demand, nobody came in, prices crashed. And then late last year, kind of COVID started hitting again with the Omicron, and we started to see prices go back up. So it's been quite a wild ride for us in our business. The last couple of weeks, things are slowing down again because of high prices, probably mortgage rates. There's a lot of headwinds right now in terms of prices and supply chain. If you look at the overall demographics for housing, however, they're quite good. Um, I didn't take the graph all the way back, but in 2004, uh, we had over 2 million housing starts in this country. Um, but you can see when the Great Recession hit, it was tough to sell lumber. Habitat for Humanity was one of our best customers. Um, really, it was hard to uh, sell our products, and so we took some downtime in a number of our sawmills. We didn't close any mills, but we definitely laid some some folks off temporarily. But you can see they've been coming back. And if you actually look at the demographics for housing right now, there is a lot of people in that age group that need to buy houses. And we talked before about affordable housing, not just houses. And so there's a lot of people spending time talking about it, uh, not here, only here on the coast, but where I live in Portland, really up and down all the Western uh, coast, California is particularly hard hit. How do we make affordable housing? They're so expensive, there's zoning issues, there's labor issues, interest rates are going up. You guys know all the all the reasons that because people want that affordable housing. There's a lot of groups working. We've tried to get involved a little bit, but it's like there's grants involved, you got government agencies, and there's local people. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. But it really is hard. And so I'm hoping we're gonna get some momentum uh, going forward. But like I said, Land's not getting any cheaper. Mortgage rates jumped almost full point in the last three weeks. We're almost back up to 5%, which for people like me, I remember my parents having a mortgage at like two and a half or three, and I said, oh, it's never gonna happen to me, you know, because my first mortgage was like 14 and a half percent. And then it got down to whatever, two or two and a half again here recently, and now it's jumped up to almost five. And historically, that's a pretty good interest rate, but if it's jumped from three to five, that's gonna probably slow so I do expect there to be a continued demand for housing, but there is some headwinds right now in our business. So let's talk a little bit about Warrington and forestry and, and timber business. So if you look at the supply of logs that go into our Warrington sawmill, uh, we buy a lot from large private folks like Greenwood here locally, uh, Weyerhaeuser, Hancock, we have a, Fair amount that comes from the Hampton Timberland, as I mentioned. Uh, there's also state uh, 
timber contracts that we buy that I'll talk about here a little bit later. And then we do get some from Washington State DNR contracts as well. The important thing to remember, and John Hampton used to always talk about it, when you'd ask him what was important about sawmills, he would say timber supply, timber supply, timber supply. Kind of makes sense. If you don't have any logs, you aren't going to make any lumber. And the, the point I made there, maybe hard to read there, is logs are 70% of the cost of our product. So yes, we have labor, yes, we have electricity, operating supplies, things like that. Uh, but log cost is by far the biggest determinant on the success of how you're going to be in support of supporting your song. So let's talk about some of the sources for, for wood. Hopefully you've heard about uh, private forest before. This is something that Hampton and several other companies started about two years ago. Um, doing business is difficult in Oregon and Washington. There's a lot of pressure environmentally, politically, on the resource industries. And we were living through a lot of litigation, um, ballot measures, people trying to stop logging, slow logging that type of thing. And so at some point we kind of said, hey, we've got to have some certainty in our business. All of you that run businesses, it's hard when the rules are always changing and you don't know what's going to happen. And as I mentioned before, in our business, we're making investments for 40 or 50 years out. When we're making investments in sawmills, you're investing for the next 20 or 30 years. And if we don't know we're going to have the timber supply, it just makes it really difficult to plan that long. So we entered into a process with some of the industry players, some of the conservation community, and we got the governor's office involved. And for a year and a half or so, we were negotiating new forest practices. And forest practices are typically how much buffer do you have to leave around streams? Can you log on steep slopes? What, how do you condition roads? All the things that, that matter in terms of how much we can harvest and what are the conservation outcomes. So after, um, and most of you are familiar with the timber war going back to the federal forests. It's been a challenge, really. And so this is a really unique process. The governor labeled this the Oregon way. I always tease her. She talks about the Oregon way, like, what are the successes of the Oregon way? Well, I think this could really be one. And so we were able to come to an agreement. We uh, got the legislation through in, in the most recent short session in Salem. Now there's a process going forward for about a year or two where we work with the federal agencies to get what's called a harvest conservation plan. So we feel good about it. Um, I can tell you there were some challenging board of directors meetings in our company when I would tell the Hamptons that we're gonna be giving up some of our timber land. It's like if you own 40 acres of farmland and somebody kind of said, we're gonna take 20% of your land and you can't farm it. That's really what's happening here is we're giving up some of our private timber land for conservation and conservancy. So I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, not everybody in the industry agrees. People say, why did you do that? You know, there's not gonna be enough, enough timber supply. And they are right. When you take some of the land off limits, you're gonna eventually have less timber supply, which is gonna mean less jobs and potentially less emissions. We're willing to compete long-term. We think we're, we're optimistic we're gonna be successful. Uh, but it's pretty creative and a pretty challenging situation, but we're proud of the role that we played in this uh, private forest. Turning to the state forests, Hampton has spent a lot of time on state forests. It's a very big part of our supply. I mentioned that we have a lot into uh, Warrington Mill, also in our Wilhelmina Mill, our Banks Mill, and our Tillamook Mill, which are all in the northwest coast here, northwest region. Uh, that state timberland is very, very important. And as I'm going to talk about, it's very important to the community here, not just this hand. So for those of you who don't know, the counties used to own this timberland. There's six or 700,000 acres. Years and years ago, the counties didn't have the money. They were trying to deal with the Tillamook burn and how to handle that and get that re replanted. And so they turned them over to the state to manage, but the counties get the benefits, the revenue that comes off of state forests. And you may have heard of a lawsuit a number of years ago the counties filed because the state kind of changed the rules and said, well, we're not going to max maximize the revenue now. We perceive that people in Oregon want more balance or more recreation or more conservation. 
so they haven't been harvesting at the full potential of the state forest. So the county sued, the county won, uh, but now it's being appealed and it's a billion dollar judgment. I don't know how it's gonna turn out uh, per se, uh, but that's kind of the, the backdrop of what's going on. But again, from a revenue standpoint, if you look at the state forest uh, last year, they harvested in total all the of all the districts, not the three just here in the local area, about 260 million feet, and that generated 114 million dollars for the counties. Class share is 23 million dollars. So for those of you who work with government agencies or anything uh, in this uh, county, 23 million dollars is a lot of money. We all know it's not enough for some of the schools and services and libraries and police and all that type of stuff. And so to the extent they don't harvest what they're really capable of doing legally, it has a financial effect on the, on the community. So I'm old enough to remember a guy on the radio named Paul Harvey, he used to have a radio show that said, let me tell you the rest of the story. So I've given you kind of the summary numbers and the slides are a little bit busy, probably hard to read, but the basic point we're trying to show here is of the $114 million that goes out to the counties, the real economic effect is much bigger, closer to $260 million. Because they just talk about the direct payments going to the counties. In addition to that, you have all the employment that goes on, you have the loggers, the truckers, some of your businesses that are involved. And so when you talk about the, the state forest harvest, you've got to think bigger than just actual payments that are, that are coming into to the counties talk about the number of employees we have, a number of small businesses that are, that are benefiting. What's not shown in those dollars is we make lumber, but we also have byproducts. We sell the chips to Fulton paper uh, producers like Iguana, there's pellet producers, particle board producers that all take residuals. We take our shavings and send those to the farmers. So there's a lot of residual things that aren't in this number, but the, the basic point is this is a big deal. So. The state is considering shrinking their harvest, it's going to have a dramatic effect on rural Oregon, which has been hit pretty hard. You know, Astoria seems to be doing pretty well, but there's a lot of areas of rural Oregon that are still really hurting. People don't think they ever really recovered from the Great Recession. One of the other points we like to make is we talk about big agencies and stuff, but Oregon is built on small businesses. And so we went through and looked at the timber sales that we harvested last year. There were 75 small family businesses that worked on those sales. Those are important components of any community. Those are people that are there every day, they're involved in the schools, they're involved in, in uh, all the activities here. Um, and I think sometimes a lot of the small businesses get lost in some of these big discussions in Portland or in Salem on what the future is. So what the state But what the state has done, they've ignored the county, uh, the counties, and just gone ahead with themselves and the Board of Forestry. And they basically, with their preliminary plan, are going to take 50% of the acres off limits for conservation or what they call conservation. So that's going to reduce the harvest 25 to 30% from levels it's been. It's going to create a budget deficit you know what, with the Department of Forestry. Of course, they're just going to go to the general fund and ask for more money. So you can imagine having six or seven hundred thousand acres that you control, and somehow you can't get enough money off that forest. You got to go to Salem and ask the taxpayer to pick up some of that money. It really is ridiculous. And again, I think the, the part that really hurt is they just didn't get the involvement of the counties, the beneficiaries of these of these lands, and what they did in terms of negotiating with the federal agency. They're doing forest practices way beyond what are required by law. So this perception that people in Oregon want more or they're going to get more. If you look at the next picture, I know it's hard to see, but if you look at the colors up there, so the pink and green is the state forest in the Astoria district of the Oregon State Forest. So you have the Astoria district, you have the forest 
Grove District and you have the Tillamook District are the three, the big three regions of the state forest. And you see what they've done. The green lands are the habitat conservation areas. Uh, the face of they're gonna be off limits. They're gonna, they'll say, well, we'll do a little bit of work in there, but typically they probably won't be doing any harvesting. So the only areas that we'll be able to harvest will be on the pink land. And if you happen to look close enough to the pink land, you'll see the green stream buffers. So they've set aside buffers that are way bigger than are required by any law or any endangered species science, just on the concept of, well, when in doubt, let's set aside more, let's set aside more. So you can see what's gonna happen if you look at the graph on the right. So in the last uh, four or five years, they've harvested about 212 million feet um, from, the, uh, from the big three districts. And a couple of years ago, when they started this process of looking at HCP, they said, based on our projection, we're gonna at least be able to maintain that 212 and maybe increase it. Well, here we are a year and a half later, and magically, the projections are now not going to see, they're actually going down. So you can see these are decade-type forecasts. But historically, the Department of Forest, every time they project something, they never meet their projections. So again, our company is working hard along with the counties on trying to influence this process. There's no legal reason, there's no endangered species or science reason to take this hard of a, of a look and cut back some of you may remember, I was involved years ago, there was a ballot measure that uh, they were trying to do in the state of Oregon that would have said, need more balance on the state forest. And the ballot measure was 50% of the land was going to be off limits. Well, that ballot measure got defeated by 73% to 23, whatever, 27%. That was about 10, 12 years ago. So they got crushed in the ballot initiative. And here we are 10 years later, and they're basically just without a vote of the people, without talking about the county. So again, it's a difficult process. Um, I, I, we understand the idea of having a debt conservation plan to get it on the private forest. They just did a lousy job of negotiating. They're just giving too much away without any extra benefits for the birds, the fish, or the species they're trying to protect. So there's a process going on. We appreciate local support. If you want to learn more, Lindsay has some materials she can hook you up with. Uh, or listen to some of the stuff. There are public meetings that they have. Supposedly they're taking input, but they're moving ahead with the process. So we're going to keep fighting for a little more of what we call balance, but it's a difficult process. Well, I want to turn to another subject that people talk about a lot. Obviously, climate change is with us. You've seen it in some of the drought. We saw the fires a couple of years ago that actually reached, reached the coast weren't in the federal forest and inland. Um, everybody's talking about carbon. And so you're talking about carbon offsets. You hear companies talk about ESG and the right kind of companies and what are we doing for carbon. So we have some of the most productive forests in the world here in Oregon. We grow trees very well. And we're already a huge carbon sink. So if you look at Hampton, for example, with our 250,000 acres of timberland, we sequester carbon every year more than, than gets a bit because we have set aside zones and things like that. And as a private company, we harvest about the growth or a little less than the growth of our, our timber. So we're always sequestering more carbon. The federal forests, which are pretty much locked up, they sequester more carbon than they have, except when they have the wildfires. And then it all goes in, into the atmosphere. Um, so when you look at carbon, it's an easy thing. So even though we're doing these HCPs, there's still a fair amount of pressure from groups saying, hey, we need to do more. Why don't you grow your trees longer? Let's have longer rotation age. Some people are saying, don't cut the trees at all, and then we'll be able to sequester more carbon. But when you think about that pressure and what that means, first of all, you have the economic effects that I've been talking about. If you shut down the forest, there go lots of jobs and lots of revenue. Uh, you may also have risk. People like to recreate in these forests. To the extent they're locked up or shut down, you may not have some of those opportunities. Um, you get the wildfires. We all know, have heard about the Tillamook burn and what we're seeing in the federal forests that have been shut down. 
But the biggest thing I think to think about is that we have beautiful trees here that make great lumber that people, the customers want. And so if we shut our forests down, where is our housing going to come from? So if you can go to the next slide. So what ends up happening is a lot of people don't understand the United States, we import about 30% of our lumber from overseas because we have the federal forest shut down. So if all of a sudden we say, okay, we're not gonna harvest anymore in Oregon, we're just gonna have our trees sit there, um, who's gonna provide that housing? Where is that lumber gonna come from? It's gonna come from overseas, it's gonna come from substitutes like steel and concrete, which aren't as a, uh, sustainable. So we have tried to push back, but there's a lot of people really talking about it. And, you know, to us, the, we feel like we're part of the answer on climate change. We grow trees, we harvest them every 40 or 50 years. When we cut the trees, they go into renewable wood products, the lumbers and houses for years and years. Um, that's a really good answer. It's accepted in Europe. People, that's what they do in Europe. And for some reason here in, in Oregon and Washington, People are still trying to find some new way and think they're really benefiting climate change by slowing down uh, or stopping logging. So we're working on this a lot. We're trying to get our message out. It's hard. You guys know what social media is like and trying to reach the public. We do a lot of tours on Big Creek and some of our properties to help people understand this. We do a great job. We should be proud of our industry, proud of our forests. They're beautiful. And I can tell you, I've been down to the U.S. South Canada and Europe, our forest practices, our laws are stronger than anybody else in the South. They don't even have forest practice laws. So why would we want to get more products from areas that don't follow the same sustainable processes that we have? So I wanted to end just with a couple other things going on here uh, locally. I want to point out the, uh, the new paper wrap that we developed. This is an interim uh, paper wrap. We have at all our sawmill locations contests going on with the schools, trying to get the kids to design some wrap that looks like their local area. I was just looking the other day, we have about 40 entries, I think, from the local schools here. Um, if you've had uh, been involved or seen kids or something, they're really creative in, in the drawings they make. Uh, but we want to emphasize locally sourced products, and so the paper wrap is going to continue to evolve here as we get those entries from the school kids. I've uh, been talking about Lindsay, you're mentioning her name, so I think a lot of you are familiar with her. She's our new outreach coordinator here. We have one in Washington. She's taken Jed's place, who you may have known. He and his family moved to another state, so we were lucky enough to get uh, Lindsay to come to work for us. Um, I heard mention of the Class of Works internship program, so I believe we, we have been involved in that as a company. Uh, we try and uh, get as many interns as we can. Probably like in most of your business, it's hard to find labor. And so we're having to do a lot of creative type of things like everybody else to make sure that uh, we have the folks we need to run our business. We helped uh, the Warrenton High School get a grant on advanced manufacturing. Hopefully you see, you saw in the Daily Historian, I think last year, some of the pictures of uh, Girls Build. It's a camp where we bring in, I don't know how to say it, whether it's girls or young women or whatever, but I think they're 10 to 12 years old, they're building tiny houses. For us to be successful at a business, in our business, we have to have a diverse workforce. We just, you know, a lot of people still think of sawmills as these big, giant, burly guys that carry logs all over the place. That's not the business anymore. The best sawmills, nobody touches the lumber. We need people who are smart, they show up, they're safe, and we have to have more diverse workforce if we're gonna be successful. We like to tell people we're a sunrise industry, not a sunset industry. So we do a lot of things in terms of labor. I'd also lastly mention just up in Big Creek, we have a variety of creative things. We've had some of, uh, like uh, Body Box has been up there performing. This year in September, we've got something called Sip and Stroll, which you can probably guess involves wine or beer or something like that as you're, as you're seeing our, our beautiful trees and seeing the views. Uh, our company actually owns uh, a winery, Carlton Winemaker Studio, and a couple vineyards as well. It's another benefit of being in a family company. You can do some kind of fun diversification. So I imagine there'll be some Hampton wines or some local beers from here that will be up there. So anyway, I'm proud of what our company does, our community involvement. Um, we 
give away a certain percentage of pre-tax profits every year. And so any ways that we can connect better with the community, please let us know. Uh, we love working here and it's a great place to do business. So thank you very much. And I don't know if there's time for questions I can do. There was a fair amount of investment in this mill, in the efficiency of this mill over the last few years. Can you talk a little bit about, about some of the changes there and making that, that mill as efficient as we can be? Yeah, thanks for the question. I meant to ask that. So again, we bought that mill during the Great Recession from Weyerhaeuser, and that mill had been there at Warrington for years and years. It was one of Willamette's best mills. Before that, it was Cabin Ham. I think there was a couple owners that worked there before, but it kind of gone downhill and hadn't been invested in. And in the sawmill business, unless you're continuing to invest in both your equipment and your people, you're probably not going to be successful. And so we've been putting a, a lot of money in the last four or five years. Uh, last year was most of the final spending to get it up to where we needed. Spent about 25 or 30 million dollars. But where most people think you're spending money is like to make it really productive and eliminate jobs. That's not where most of the money went. The vast majority of the money went on value creation. So if you haven't been through one of our sawmills, the log comes in and gets scanned. You've got lasers that can scan through and actually the wood, and then it runs thousands and sometimes millions of simulations. Like, how can we cut that log to get the most value? I mentioned before, we have Home Depot and Lowe's contracts. So how can we get, and they'll pay extra for wood because they want the nicest wood. So how can we go through there and not only get the most fiber, the most lumber out of every log, but really the most value? So we've got sales prices and stuff built into the database. There's artificial intelligence built into that. The scanning, the cameras have gotten all better. And so at each machine center, it's scanning that either the log or the cant or the flitch to say, how can we get the most value? So those are the type of investments we've been making. I will say that we have invested a little bit more money also in like conveyors and stuff under the sawmill. Um, throughout our company and our industry, very difficult to find anybody who wants to shovel sawdust, even for 21 bucks an hour. Those are the hardest jobs to fill. That's where we get turnover. That's where you can have a safety issue, somebody can hurt their back. So we have invested some in uh, trying to re-engineer out some of the cleanup positions. But overall, um, we have about 150 people there, even with the investment, it's, it hasn't gone down more than four or five people. So, appreciate the question, because it's, a lot of people don't understand the industry and how much technology really is in there. So, yeah. I just want to thank you on the Class of Force Internship Program. Hampton was really the first employer, and you started out the program here in Classic County, so we really appreciate that. And also on the, uh, the CFEDC, the Class of Forestry Economic Development Committee, looking at our officers for, we have a regular tour coming up in October live, and we're planning to do the educational sessions to discuss this um, habitat conservation plan that you just mentioned. So we're here to educate the public about that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. This might be a weird question, but um, and forgive my ignorance. You know, when I think about a forest fire, it's devastating, right? You know, um, green trees, I would imagine, are not like best fuel. So has anybody been working on something that kind of like maybe a machine that clears out the detritus on the floor of the forest and kind of eliminates some of that fuel? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Where you see it more is on the federal forest because, you know, a lot of us drive out to Sun River or where, but some of us don't go in the wilderness areas and stuff. And it's so overgrown there that like you say, it's all the stuff down below um, the bigger trees, if they're healthy, they're fine, but you get the burn up from all the small trees and, and weeds and everything else that grows. And then it gets them in the crown of the trees and then and you've seen the pictures of yeah. the embers blowing a, a mile or two you know, over the river. So there are some uh, equipment to do, but it's, you know what the land's like around yeah. here? It's, it's really <laughs> steep and yeah. stuff. Um, you're starting to see technology used in forestry on drones and things. There are now logging equipment, they call it, I can't remember, steep slope, whatever, they're, they're run by computers and stuff that have the ability to harvest on steep slopes. But it's pretty challenging to go into those, those areas. You see it more in the uh, Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, where you have the, 
some of the big pine trees. Here in, in the West Coast, the Douglas fir, the hemlock, they really need the sunlight. And so that's why you go through and try and take out these patches so when you plant the new trees, they can get the sunlight to grow. But you're exactly right. You just leave forests alone. They're like people. At some point, they get diseased. You know, the bugs come, they get old, and they get, with a combination of that and climate change and the droughts, they're really at risk of fire. So keeping some management going on forests really 